Advancing the cause of liberty takes more than just coming up with ideas. It means making them happen. This is Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on episode 53 of Society and the State. This is your co-host, Connor Boyack. I'm flying solo on this episode. Brian's actually doing a radio stint as we speak, and so we'll see if I man the controls correctly. He's usually our our technical guy with all of his radio experience. But uh, I am very fortunate to have some time today to talk to a guy that I've been connected to for a while, although his life has changed quite a bit since we first uh, met and and really had a lot of interaction. So we'll get into that, the why and and why it's relevant for you. We're going to be talking today about uh, the power of influence and specifically how to influence others. Uh, I'm joined by Josh Steinle, a guy who's made a name for himself in being able to influence others. And let's get into that and why it's relevant to you. So, Josh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Connor. It's awesome to be here chatting with you again. We do have a long history. I was just thinking today that I think the first time we met was back around 2008 or maybe even 2007. So it's been like going on 10 years here. About a decade. We're in double digits, my friend. So, you know, back then you and I had very different lives. I was uh, doing web development full time and had a very small side political hobby. Right. And you were you've now, I mean, moved halfway across the world and you're doing all sorts of different things. So um, I want to start, though. Let's talk about your your key profession before we get into your side hustle and, and what you're growing here with influence. But you've had this web agency, MWI, that has, as I recall, kind of gone through some roller coaster Uh, periods in the past. You've been the CEO. You've tried to grow this thing. You've had some challenges. Talk to us about uh, where MWI is now, what you do, and then a little bit of like how you got there. As I recall, you had a lot of challenges and and stress and everything in, in just even being able to meet payroll and basic stuff like that. But now you've been very successful. So what are you doing? And then tell us a little bit of how you got there and what that struggle was like. Yeah, so MWI has been kind of a 20-year overnight success now, and today it sounds great when I tell you the place that we're in. We have offices around the world. We're in Hong Kong, China, Singapore, the UK, and the US. We've got about 35 people. We do work with large clients, small clients, everything in between, and we're a full-service digital marketing agency, so we're doing websites, SEO, paid search, content marketing, social, digital PR email, all sorts of stuff. And it's in a great place today. But man, the history starting in 1999, when I founded it, it really was a roller coaster. It was ups and downs. It was struggling to make payroll. It was struggling to come up with payments to pay off credit cards and funding it every which way I could with loans from family and friends and banks and everything else. And just the IRS, I borrowed money from the IRS. You don't do that. (laughs) And please don't do not do that. But uh, I borrowed money. I didn't pay taxes. That's how I borrowed money from the IRS. And I've been every which way in this business. But the last few years have just been amazing and have been uh, uh, the better part of the roller coaster ride, you could say. My granddad uh, always used acronyms for all sorts of sayings. And the one that has stuck with me is PPPG, which uh, he coined, and it means persistence pays pretty good. And that's what granddad would always say. So talk to me really quick about persistence, because, you know, almost two decades you've been at this. You had all these challenges at the beginning. Um, you've become a success now. What, what, how much of that do you attribute to persistence, just the grind and getting, th- like, do you have a story or talk to me about your experience with persistence? You know, it's it's funny because people ask me, like, why did you keep on doing this? Why did you keep on going if it wasn't working out? And the thing is, it always was working out just enough to keep me going, but never quite enough to be doing well and make me feel like it was worth. I mean, it was financially, it was not lucrative. I was look, all my friends who went into accounting and these solid, stable jobs out of college we're always talking to me and saying, oh, you're living the dream. You've got this entrepreneurial thing going on. You're running your own business. And I'm like, yeah, but if you could see behind the scenes, I'm not making any money and I'm struggling and I'm not sleeping and my health is in ruins. And so I was always looking at them and thinking, man, they've got it made. And they're looking at me and thinking, man, he's got it made. He's having all the fun. And the grass is greener. So grass, yeah, grass is greener on both sides. But it was always doing well enough. 
to keep me going. And then there was always this big success that was just on the horizon, just out of reach. Oh, we're about to land the steel. We're about to get this different thing. And so there's always something new going on that just kept me going. And so I can't really take credit for saying I was a visionary or it was this long-term plan or anything. It was just kind of trying to survive from one step to the next. And then finally, it got to this point where it worked out. And what really changed was two things. One, I brought on a partner who complimented some weaknesses that I had. I was not good at sales. And so people would call and they'd leave a voicemail because they wanted to give me money. They wanted to hire my agency. And I'd get back to them like two or three days later. I'd be like, hey, (laughs) sorry for the delay on the call. I was kind of busy. But yeah, we'd be happy to work with you. And of course, that doesn't work well with sales. (laughs) And I'd respond to emails like a week later or something. It was just like, I was just not good at the sales thing. I didn't like talking to people really. I'm kind of antisocial and shy and stuff. So it was just, it was hard for me to jump on the phone and talk to people. So I hired somebody who loved getting on the phone and who was really good on sales. And I had tried hiring somebody to do sales for years. So I had hired 15 people. Nobody quite worked out. And then I hired the right guy and it just popped. So I got this guy, Corey Blake, on board and now he's my partner. And that was a big shift. And that was in 2013. And around the same time in 2013, I was talking to a friend of mine. She's a PR guru there in Utah, Cheryl Snap Connor. And she was writing for Forbes. And I said, hey, how'd you get this gig writing for Forbes? I mean, you're running an agency. And how do you do this writing as well and be a journalist at the same time? And she said, oh, I'm not a journalist. I just get to write for Forbes. I'm a contributor. I was like, what's a contributor? She said, well, Forbes has staff writers who get paid, you know, journalism grads, and then they have these other people who are experts who are working, and they get to write for Forbes, and they do this for the exposure. And I said, oh, that sounds cool. And she said, oh, I'll introduce you to my editor. Maybe you'd like to have you write for Forbes. And I thought, well, that sounds like a great opportunity. So long story short, she introduced us. The editor wanted me to write for Forbes and talk about all my nightmares running a business. And Mm -hmm. so I got on board with Forbes and started writing about entrepreneurship and startups. And then I had this epiphany that, hey, maybe if I wrote about marketing, maybe people would hire my agency and trust me to do their marketing. And I started writing about marketing for Forbes and then it just exploded. The floodgates came open and we started getting tons of leads. So now I was generating a lot of leads and I had this great sales guy who could receive these leads And we went from being this tiny company that was on the edge of going out of business to now growing into this multinational, multimillion dollar thing that is actually kind of running itself now and is for the first time in almost 20 years, I feel like, wow, we actually have a successful business. And and the Forbes thing for you has turned into many other writing opportunities. I mean, you've been in Inc. and Mashable and TechCrunch and entrepreneur magazine and venture beat and Fox and all this stuff. And so, and, and that begins, I think, to take us into kind of what you're growing into and what I'd love for you to share some wisdom with our listeners about today. And that is how to influence others. And so you've been using this writing as a platform, both for lead generation for your business, but to share best practices and ideas and opening up to your own experience about talking about your struggles and your failures and how you overcame them. And, and then of course, by extension, how the reader can do that too. Um, why has influence become such an important focus for you? I mean, now you've got um, you've got a book out that's mostly targeted for chief marketing officers, but has a lot of relevant stuff for other people as well. You've got this, what, what would you call it, a project called Influencer Inc. and the podcast. Talk to us a little bit about your new focus and why the, the role of it, being able to influence others effectively has become important to you. All right, so... After I started writing for Forbes, like you said, I started getting into these other publications because I was afraid I might lose that Forbes opportunity. I thought, man, if this Forbes thing is great, but what if it disappears? What if they stop this contributor program? Or what if I do something stupid and get kicked off the system? Then I'm just out. So I thought I should leverage this. So I went to every other publication I could and I said, hey, I write for Forbes. I'd like to write for you too. And so I got myself into all these other publications and developed relationships And then as I was writing for these publications, I thought I need to do a book and who could I target that would benefit my marketing agency? And we get hired by marketing people. So I thought, well, I'll write a book about chief marketing officers. And so I 
leveraged that Forbes position to get a bunch of interviews with CMOs from GE, Spotify, PayPal, Home Depot, Target, all these companies, and was able to put all these interviews together in a book. And so now I've got this credibility with CMOs because of this book I wrote. And I got the book deal for this through a publisher because of writing for Forbes as well. And after a few years of writing for Forbes and these other publications and getting this book out, which also then led to speaking engagements, then people started coming to me and asking, hey, Josh, how did you do this and how can I do this for my business and help this to grow my business? And at first I thought, well, this isn't what I do. I'm running a marketing agency. I'm not teaching people how to do this influence stuff, but people were offering me money to coach them. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting because I do enjoy coaching and teaching and influence is kind of life, right? I mean, we're all here, we're influencing each other in one way or another. And I thought this would be interesting to focus on this and it would be a good thing. I mean, I believe most people in the world are good people. And if I can help people become more influential, then I'm making the world a better place. So as opportunities continued to arise, I thought, well, I should write a book about influence because that way I can help a lot of people. I can't help a lot of people coaching one-on-one. -on -one. I can maybe work with five people that way. But if I write a book, then I can help a lot of people. So I started working on this book and I came up with this title, Influencer Inc., focusing on helping people become more influential, but especially people who wanted to grow a business to become more influential. And then I thought, well, I should launch a Facebook group to see if people are really interested in this before I publish a book and nobody buys it. So I launched a Facebook Facebook group one year ago called Influencer Inc. And it just exploded and took off. And now we just passed 4,000 members the other day. And there are all these people in there talking about public speaking and PR and how to grow their businesses using influence and thought leadership and personal branding. And so this group really took off and started growing. And then it became this side project that has become my main project now where we're starting this publishing and training and events company. We're launching online courses and we're working on this book and we're doing a live event in Utah in uh, June next year. And we're doing all these different things around influence and personal branding and thought leadership and basically how to make yourself famous, but in a good way, in a way that you're helping people and you're serving others by spreading your message, whatever that message happens to be. I want to jump on that last part because so much of marketing and especially getting into being a thought leader and influencing others, you get people who wrap their ego in it, into it so intimately that it's about them. And, and even what you said, just to kind of play devil's advocate at least a little bit um, here, you know, talking about doing this for the purpose of growing your business, that it has a specific financial end, that I want to influence others so that they, you know, hire me or pay me. So what is it about influence? You said something there at the end that I thought was key, that it's, uh, in your mind at least, right there you said it's more about serving others and helping others. So how do you, how do you combat the, um, maybe the tendency or the temptation to have your ego be the center of influencing others versus having it be more about um, serving others and influencing them? Yeah, this is a constant struggle because we all have a little bit of an ego at least. I mean, it's very rare to find somebody who's just completely without any sort of ego or without any desire to promote themselves or to feel important. I mean, we all kind of want to feel important, right? And I think that can be turned to productive means. I think we can funnel that desire into more service and we can keep on working towards overcoming that ego. But what I see is that that ego actually holds a lot of people back from reaching their full potential and serving as much as they could because they're so afraid of promoting themselves that they don't share what they know. They don't share their experiences because they're afraid of looking like that guy, that guy who's always so self-promotional. So when I, I remember what uh, Cheryl, my friend who got me into Forbes said when I started down this road because I was uncomfortable with it. I, she said, Hey, you should write for Forbes and you should talk about your own story and all the experiences you've been through. And I said, Cheryl, I don't really want to talk about myself. I'm not comfortable doing that. I'd rather talk about the business. Can't I talk about the business and promote the business? I just want the business to grow. I don't care about growing my own brand. 
And she said, Josh, it's not about you. Get over yourself. And I said, wait, get over myself and then talk about myself. What do you mean? <laughs> and she said, it's not about you. You're you're building up your personal brand in order to build the business because people don't care about your business. They care about your story. And I said, well, okay, I get that. And she said, it's, it's people do business with people that they know, like, and trust. They don't like doing business with faceless corporations or these organizations. They like doing business with a person. And so you're putting yourself out there in order to grow the business, in order to serve others better. And so it's not about you. It is about creating this brand of you, but it's really not about you. And that might sound like it might take some mental gymnastics to work through that. But as I dove into that, I realized, you know, this makes sense. And it is a fine line to walk because at any moment I can start believing my own hype that I'm trying to produce about myself and think, man, I'm pretty awesome. I mean, look at a, this list of achievements and these things I've accomplished and these publications. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty awesome. It'd be easy to fall into that. But the fun thing is that as I get more experience and as I grow my personal brand, it leads to these opportunities to associate with other people who are so far beyond what I've accomplished that that helps to keep me humble a bit because I look at these other people I'm around and I'm like, yeah, I've done this stuff, but look at this guy that I'm on stage with speaking at this event. Like I'm, I'm not anywhere close to this guy. Like I'm constantly battling imposter syndrome and feeling like, man, I'm around all these really amazing people. And that keeps me humble a bit. So I guess the nature of what I'm doing keeps me humble just by associating with these people and seeing how much more I could be doing and how much more other people are doing. And also just it's been so fast for me that maybe it hasn't have had time to settle in yet because I look at where I was just three or four years ago and nobody knew who I was. Nobody in my business was failing. And those lessons were driven home over a 13, 14 year period that I'm really not that good of an entrepreneur and I really don't know what I'm doing. And so I've had so many humbling experiences that have just pounded into me that I'm not that smart of a guy. And so I guess uh, some of that stuff is stuck, at least for now, and hopefully it doesn't leave me in the long term. I, I like, you know, the idea is I think about, uh, you're talking about primarily business, and, and there's a reason why on our podcast we didn't want to be just political, we didn't want to just be economic. There's this fusion between the two more broadly where at the end of the day it's about how we interact with one another. And as you pointed out, we are all trying to influence other people, and in turn we are all influenced by other people. And whether it's to influence someone so that they vote differently or that they move somewhere or buy my product, at the end of the day, we're trying to, you know, change people's thoughts and behavior. And it's just part of humanity. It's a part of civilization where we're in close contact with one another. And for many people, I think business is kind of a dirty word and you're trying to extract, you know, money from people. But really what's happening is that there's an exchange in value that's taking place. And if your business can do something better, cheaper, quicker than everyone else, you are doing a service to that company, your client, because they have a need. They need a website or they, you know, they need uh, the service that you're offering so that they can reach their customers and fulfill their goals. And so business at the end of the day is just a vehicle for serving other people. And you can do things really shady and you can, you know, uh, defraud people or whatever in business. But but true business, true exchange uh, and, and commerce is just about um, it's a win-win situation. There's mutual benefit taking place between the two parties. And so I really like that you position it that way, that influencing other people need not. This isn't propaganda. This isn't using psychology to manipulate people. You know, there's kind of the good and the bad of that, where the bad is more the propaganda. The good is like public relations and trying to let people know that you're out there and here's this service I offer. And if I can help you, please let me know. Um, and so I really like that, that that aspect of it is emphasized. Even if our listeners aren't, you know, an entrepreneur themselves or starting their own business, at the end of the day, it comes down to human human psychology and influence. And maybe that has to translate to a mom and her kids. And how do you have more influence over your teenagers who are making some very life altering decisions, right? Or how do you, how do you interact with your boss better and try and influence them to steer the company in a better way? It, it's so expansive, I think, beyond just people running their own business that there's so much value in learning about how to influence. And so 
we're running up against uh, the the end of the show. I want to ask you, I think, a final question, unless another one uh, pops in my head. And that is, talk to us maybe about like some of the initial steps and influences. You talk, you're doing this master class and these courses and starting to mentor people. Couched in your own experience, what do you think are some of the initial steps for someone who does want to grow their personal brand, who does want to position themselves to be able to be an influence on others? And, and as you say, hopefully... Uh, through serving them and helping them fulfill their own goals. What's a person to do to kind of start on that path um, to get to where you are? There are two main steps everybody needs to take to become more influential. One is to figure out who are you. Second is who's your audience. And when I say who you are, what I mean is what makes you special? What do you have to offer? What's your mission? What's your calling? What do you know more about than anybody else? What are you an expert at? What's your genius zone where you can contribute in a way that nobody else can contribute quite the way that you can. And that doesn't mean that you're the uber expert. And I mean, I say, you know, more about something else than everybody else, but that can be something relatively simple. So you might say, for example, and this, this happens by combining different areas that you're an expert in. For example, I know a lot about marketing because I've run a marketing agency, but so do 50,000 other people in the world. So I'm not special as a marketer, but I also know a lot about skateboarding because that's just a hobby that I grew up with. And a lot of other people know a lot about skateboarding too. So I'm not the uber expert of skateboarding, but if you put these two together and you say, how many people in the world own a marketing agency and know a lot about skateboarding? Well, now you've got a really short list. So that might be my genius zone. Now, now that's not where I've chosen to focus on, but I could focus on that and build a business around that if I wanted to. So what makes you special? What different expert areas can you take and combine together and create something special that you know more about than anybody else when you combine those areas? That's figuring out what's special about you. And then the next question is, well, who cares? Who's your audience? Who are you going after? Who's going to pay money for that because they value that information so much? When you figure out where the money flows, then you can figure out where your greatest area of service is, who you can serve the best, because whoever is going to pay you the most money, that's where you're providing the most value. That's where you're serving the most. And so figuring out who your audience is, who you want to influence, and then it's figuring out your message and exactly how you're going to communicate But figuring out those two things, who you are, what makes you special, and then who your audience is, those are the two beginning steps. And sometimes I see people who just say, well, I just want to write for Forbes and I just want to write stuff. Well, what are you writing about and who are you writing to? And I didn't have this figured out when I started writing for Forbes. So I was writing about entrepreneurship and startups and all this stuff. And that was great and that was fun, but I wasn't making any money off of that. It wasn't sustainable. It wasn't benefiting my business. But when I switched over to writing for chief marketing officers and I was writing about marketing on Forbes, then all of a sudden my business exploded and then it became sustainable. Then it became something that I could really focus on and provide so much more value for people by figuring out who wanted the information that I had. Josh, is there a book that you often recommend or that comes to mind that in addition to the, the you know thought uh, experiment that you just suggested of things that people need to figure out, what, what one book out there would you consider a must read for someone trying to start on this path? There is a great book called Persuasion that just came out by Richard Cialdini, and he wrote a book 20 years ago called Influence. And it's kind of the Bible on this stuff, on influence and how to influence other people. But the book Influence is more about resisting advertising and marketing and the tricks that advertisers use. And Persuasion is more about the positive side of how do you use influence to help other people. And so I really like Persuasion. The other book, Influence, is great as well. But Persuasion by Richard Cialdini is just an expert, ex- excellent book on this. Um, is it Richard or Robert? I think it's Robert. Robert. Sorry. Yeah, Robert Cialdini. Yeah. And I'm glad you you recommended uh, Persuasion, but also Influence. They are eye-opening books that I consider must read. And you're right. Like Influence is more about playing defense. Uh, but for someone who does quite a bit of marketing for our own stuff, there's so many lessons and and tips that I extracted from there that we've been able to use and incorporate. And again, there's, you know, the positive way to use this and the negative influence is just a tool. Psychology is just a tool. It can definitely be used for good and for bad. And so I appreciate folks, Josh, like you out there trying to help others use it for good, build their business, improve their life while serving others. 
We're going to link to your website um, and to that book that you just mentioned for those who want to pick it up on today's show notes page, which is societyinthestate.com slash 53. Josh, thanks for uh, spending a little time today. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Connor. So great to reconnect here. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. 